Hi, this is Paul. Before I caught Luke's live stream this morning, I uh, had, of course, to throw the frisbee with the dog and do some things, and the Holy Post was up and to the left on my algo brought me and talked about Driscoll and Dawkins and the stuff that the Holy Post podcast always talks about. And so I listened to it. For first impression came right away and it was sort of a cultural moment where it's like, yeah, these guys are a long ways from the world I've been living in for the last seven years. Here's the introduction to the podcast. Welcome to the Holy Post. Richard Dawkins says that he doesn't believe one word of the Christian faith, but he now considers himself a cultural Christian, and he wants to defend the Christian values of his country against foreign influence. Does this represent an alignment between the new atheists and Christian nationalists? Then Curtis Chang shares about the... I, I didn't phrase it that way exact, exactly when I first heard about it, but my, my initial thought, too, was, oh, new atheism and Christian nationalism. I wonder if anybody's going to catch the connection to this. And they did. They do a lot of podcasts on dread Christian nationalism. After Party, the new curriculum he's developed with David French and Russell Moore to help Christians focus on hope and humility rather than partisanship. Also this week, Mark Driscoll gets booted from a men's conference and another infraction by a Florida man with a Bible. For our Holy Post Plus subscribers, we have a new episode of Getting Schooled by Caitlin Chess, and there's a new SkyPod episode every Friday. Of course, that is just scratching the surface of what you get for being a Holy Post Plus subscriber, not to mention the warm, fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're helping us to create fun, pro-neighbor, and orthodox Christian content. To They're making orthodox Christian content! <laughs> <laughs> I, you see how much this, my time in the corner has colonized me? They, they don't even say small, low, orthodox Christian content. I thought, what, what kind of orthodoxy are these people anyway? Anyway, no beards? No what? Well, let's, let's, let's jump into it. Phil, of course, has his uh, uh, Florida man things and a Bible. And that's, that's, that's the usual stuff from 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 Phil and the gang. I, I used to, before Jordan Peterson, before any of this, I caught this podcast right away. I was very interested in Phil Vischer's story. He wrote a book about basically the the fall of Veggie Tales, which is really worth reading. I, I really enjoyed that book. And so I, I listened to all of this before Jordan Peterson and I sort of lost interest. And now it's kind of funny sort of reconnecting and seeing how they see seeing seeing how I've changed, seeing where they're where they are. Even even just look at Sky Jatani. He's got the little he's got the stormtrooper bookends holding up his stuff. He's got that good book by uh, Rutledge on the crucifixion. Yada yada yada. But just just the orthodoxy thing was interesting. They talked about they talked about Mark Driscoll I'll probably I might talk about this a little bit more. One of the key things besides the whole finish the thought, Vander Clay. Uh, Richard Rowland had a great tweet on Twitter. Richard Rowland tweets: At some point, you have to ask yourself, does my version of Christianity look more like the Colosseum or the martyrs who who died there? This Driscoll moment. I, I agree with Sky Jatani in this way. This this Driscoll moment is so packed with so many issues with respect to American evangelicalism and and these guys being about at the epicenter of Carol Stream uh, Christianity Today. Sky used to be an editor of Christianity Today. Um, Phil Visser, basically Wheaton. This whole Wheaton this whole Wheaton bubble and evangelical Christianity, they're really right at the center. So one of the books that got sent to me because I'm involved in a something in my in my day job is uh, Caitlin Schles, The Ballad in the Bible. I haven't read it yet. I, I, I'm, I'm curious, and most of my curiosity is because she's on this podcast. And so I'm, I am going to... I have to continue to improve my capacity to not spend eight hours reading a book like this, but basically go through it in an hour or two and be fair to it. That's, I remember in seminary, um, 
uh, Neil Plantinga, Alvin Plantinga's younger brother, who's a theologian and was my systematics professor at Calvin Seminary when I was there, he said, you know, one of the, one of the skills you want to pick up at some time, not just to me, but to the whole class, one of the skills you want to pick up sometime is to be able to sort of go through a book quickly and basically get an understanding of it without actually having to read the whole thing. And um, I, that's a skill I need to perfect. And actually, paper books are a little better at that than Kindle books. But since I was given this paper book as participating in something or other, I intend to look at it. But the... Now, I, I also had a little back and forth with Elizabeth Oldfield on Twitter. So I haven't done anything with it, but I tweeted a um, I tweeted out Chris Williamson's video with David Brooks because I've been reading David Brooks for years, and uh, David Brooks' story is so interesting. He would deserve a video all on him, all on his own trajectory and journey. I don't think he's done a memoir, and he hasn't written a lot about his private life, but it always sort of sneaks out there. Anyway, his interview with, with Chris Williamson was really excellent, and they, they went into, uh, my tweet was, I sort of feel like a magician listening to Chris Williamson and David Brooks giving away conversational secrets in this video. And Elizabeth Oldfield, I was actually thinking about her because, again, when when we talked together, what I've been doing in the corner with the Randos conversations and what she does in the sacred with more high status people conversations is very, very similar in terms of the conversational style. Many things that they talked about in the video. And so I, I said, I see you, Elizabeth Oldfield. I thought I, I thought of you too when I was listening to this. Same bag of tricks you use. And she said, Well, I prefer a bag I prefer a bag of profound spiritual wise postures. <laughs> So then I tweeted a little something from Keeping Up Appearances. But so sensibility is such a big deal here because a, a deep part of, now I don't know, only about 50% of my listeners are from the United States. The rest are from the rest of the world. After the United States, it tends to be Canada, UK, Netherlands, those are Australia, those are sort of the next four, and Germany, etc cetera, etc cetera. but if you want to understand american evangelicalism you have to understand their impulse to not be mistaken for fundamentalist usually for cultural status reasons and so a big part of the holy post is sort of laughing at stupid fundamentalist tricks and so the first story here was a uh, Florida man scales a tower with a Bible. And so Phil found another another stupid fundamentalist joke. And so one, one of the ways you can sort of distance yourself from a group is to mock them. And so there's a fair amount of mocking fundamentalists. And there's a fair amount of dealing with other evangelicals by either expressing concern, disdain, animosity, or all or flat out mockery. And... This, this actually has a lot to do with a lot of what goes on in sort of moderate progressive evangelical spaces. And others have nailed this before. Um, uh, what was his name? The, uh, former, the former editor of Christianity Today that on his way out, before he joined the Roman Catholic Church, on his way out, he writes this scathing substack where he basically says, everyone at Christianity Today is sort of you know, they're, they, they, they're, 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 their day really gets made when they're quoted in the New York Times. And so you just have this sense of moderate to moderate progressive evangelicals always just sorting to sort of want to be embraced by the blue church. The, by the blue church. They, are, they are sort of aspiring mainliners who have some theological convictions that are more aligned with what the fundamentalists have, but socially they want to be where the mainline used to be um, in the mid-20th century. That's sort of the best way to think about moderate progressive evangelicals. And and so a good, a good bit of this is sort of lighthearted, um, maybe not well received on the part of fundamentalists. And there are many people that once I post this, uh, 
<laughs> Hank Cruz, um, will 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 hate on these people. They will hate on these people, and they'll hate on David French, and they'll hate on Russell Moore. And I know I'm going to hear it in the comments, and I know I'm going to hear it on Twitter, but there's a lot going on underneath the surface in terms of sensibilities. I, I think a lot about Jonathan Peugeot when I think about these dyna dynamics, and and Sky talks about it a little bit here. Let's see if I can find it. Sure, I think we'd I think we'd all agree with that, yeah. right? If yeah. you are offended at the Asherah pole sword swallowing stripper at your your Bible conference, yeah. you should talk to the organizer. Now, there's a few points I want to make in here that I wanted to make about that thing. The 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 it, the the little the little screed given by Driscoll. All along, now, first of all, let me say that there's a big part of me that is a lot like these guys. Okay, um, there's a big part of me that is like these guys. There's when I when I listen to Phil Vischer, there's a lot of Phil Vischer in me. And when um, when Trent Horn talked about Protestant ministers and likened them to OnlyFans girls, I had I had a dozen really fun video ideas in mind that if I had the time, I so would have made and posted and probably would have lost a few subscribers from my channel by doing it. Um, there is that, that trollish part of me is, is, is not very far from Phil Vischer. So I have no hate for any of these people, but I remember when people were sort of discovering Peugeot and they're sort of talking about symbolism. And I, I said, look, Symbolism has never gone anywhere. Peugeot is moving a different symbolism. In the video I released today where I talked about a new imminentizing that Peugeot is doing, that's part of it. But Driscoll gets the symbolism, you know, gets a symbolism, how faithful this take is. And again, part of the thing to understand about Driscoll, if you go back and listen to the rise and falls of Mars Hill, it's very clear that somewhere in Mark Driscoll's psyche, there is a young boy growing up in a in a home where his father is not a role model and his mom is getting the brunt of the stick. There is an oldest child of five. I looked up his I looked up his bio on Wikipedia because I just had to sort of confirm um, where it is. Driscoll was born October 11, 1970, Grand Forks, North Dakota. He was raised Roman Catholic in the Riverton Heights area of SeaTech, Washington which he described as a very rough neighborhood where serial killer Ted Bundy had picked up the victims. He's the oldest of five children, the son of a union drywaller. He describes a difficult family history of abuse and crime, writing, the men on my father's side included uneducated alcoholics, mental patients, and women beaters. What you see from Mark Driscoll is the oldest son of a wife beater. Because what is he going to do? Just watch Yellowstone. And look at look at the character of what's his name? He's, he's the main hand on the on the Yellowstone Ranch. You'll put it in the comment section. Um, that way you all get to play along. When I forget to name somebody, it'll bubble up in a few minutes. Rip, there it is. He he is Mark Driscoll is Rip from Yellowstone, and the fact that anything sort of symbolically gets connected to any kind of any kind of um, objectifying women or sex worker stuff, he is going to go off. He is going to go off as reliably as Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park, and and you just and when you listen to him go off, you hear the oldest son, you hear a little boy trying to perfect, protect mommy from daddy. That's what you hear from that dude. It is just so crystal clear. So the fact that. You know, all that symbolism sort of lines up there. But now, part of what I love... See, now, a lot of people don't get Grim Grizz. But to me, Grim Grizz is very much in this. Because there is sort of an earnest mercenary marketer element of evangelicalism that will put up the big top it is it is Barnum and Bailey circus and 
Is it silly sometimes? Yes. Is it foolish sometimes? Yes. Is it cringingly earnest sometimes? Yes. Do I despise it? No. Do I employ it? I try not to. But I don't despise the people that do it. Maybe I'm not close enough to them. Maybe it's because of when and where I grew up. I My father would never have, my, my father was nothing but kind and loving and wonderful to my mother. My grandfather the same way. I've told this story before. I remember driving from driving from Michigan to New Jersey with my grandfather and grandmother when they were getting up in age, myself and my sister. Of course, traditional people, I sat in the front seat with grandpa because we would take turns driving. My sister sat in the back seat with grandma, which she really did not like given her much more liberationist posture. And um, if I would sort of doze off and take a nap, my grandmother would, you know, sort of um, scold my grandfather. He's trying to take a nap. But in the meanwhile, my grandmother in the backseat was talking the whole time to my sister. And my sister's like, I'm trying to take a nap. <laughs> and, um, but my grandmother, gosh, she was an amazing woman. But she was, um, she really, really tried to be that kind of submissive wife. She just could never pull it off because she was just to herself. And so she'd be in that back seat and she'd, her name, his name was Hiram. She'd be like, hi, I'm a little warm. He'd turn up the air conditioner. Oh, now, now I'm a little cool. He'd turn down the air conditioner. The drive from Grand Rapids to New Jersey was 14 hours. And I watched that man I don't know how many times an hour lean over and adjust the temperature for that woman the whole way there. And I looked at him and I thought, my goodness, man, I have no idea how you have developed the patience that you have, but he did it. He did it. So those are the men in my family. Okay. These, these were the men that they loved their wives and in a very Ephesians way, they laid down their lives for their wives. Um, so, yeah, Driscoll comes by this honesty, but the but there's an element of the silliness that that I you know I'm with these guys. I can laugh at it too. Sometimes you see the craziest things, and I will tell you, um, every culture. Whether I saw I saw crazy things in the Dominican Republic, I saw crazy things in Patterson, New Jersey. I see crazy things at Living Stones. And some of you know what I'm talking about because some of it I put on my channel. And I love it. I love it. And the more earnest they are about it, the more I love it. Because all of the disdain that people have towards these backwood evangelicals who are putting up tents and running around with snakes and, and doing all kinds of stuff. They're making a joyful noise. They are making a joyful noise. And I, I believe God accepts their gifts. I don't know that the gifts that I give that are middle class, middle American, cultured, uptight, upright, educated, are of a greater value than someone bringing an elephant into the worship service. I don't know that that's the case. Because, I, so, so yeah, so, you know, here they have a little bit of fun at fundamentalist expense. I mm. think this story is absolutely amazing. It is, it is the turducken of cons Yeah, I, I'm going to pass on the turducken stuff. You can listen to it. The link's below in, that, in this section. Sumer Christian <laughs> brings in like this demonic spiritual warfare element. Want to pick at this thing and the layers of dysfunction and grotesqueness. It, that's why I call it the turducken of consumer Christianity. It's just uh -huh. like one perfectly constructed story of application to this story. It's just profoundly interesting. If you're curious what happened last year at the Stronger Man Conference, a tank came out into mm -hmm. the arena, an actual army tank, and then the the top opened, and who was driving it? Chuck Norris, the action hero from the <laughs> 90s. See, I love that stuff. And I do. I remember 
there was a church. It was connected to another church in the valley and a CRC church. They were a Pentecostal church. And that, 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 God bless that Pentecostal pastor. He figured out that, gosh, there's money in that, in the, among those CRC almond growers and dairy farmers and all that, 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 that big pharma money that, that the CRC gets to pull down through the Lilly Foundation. Um, you know, I get, I get, I get to clip this, this still. And so, and so he was, he was thinking of somehow affiliating with the Christian Reform Church to, you know, to, to, to get in on these programs and to get some resources and, and, and all of that. And so I was part of the new church development team. So I, I visited his church and, you know, they had a healing service and there was speaking in tongues and there was, there was, and, and now, of course, I'd been a missionary in the Dominican Republic. I'd seen some wild stuff. And the kind of stuff that I was looking at was pretty much garden variety, American Pentecostal stuff that was going on. And so I just watched. But the dude afterwards, he's like, I was really worried about, you know, what, what you were going to do. Because he had visited some of the other CRC guys and some of the other CRC guys were just a little more tightly wound. And I said, no, dude, it's all right. It's all cool. I don't know if you'll ever fit in the Christian Reformed Church, but <laughs> you, it's, I, it's, it's totally good. It's totally fine. And I also know that there are charlatans. There, like I've said many times on this channel, there's no con like the religious con. There's no place in people's sensibilities where you can con them faster than a, with a religious con. I completely get it. But... Um, you know, I, I, you, you, you know, okay. So Chuck Norris drives in with a tank to this conference. I, I laugh too. I laugh too. I, I just don't, I just don't get upset by it. I wouldn't organize it that way, but I don't get upset by it anyway. So, so then they get on to Richard Dawkins. So messed up. Uh, Russell Moore wrote a piece. Weird. Yeah, and it's a little weird. Russell, Russell, Russell Moore, our friend Russell Moore wrote a piece about new atheism because Richard Dawkins is in the news. Richard Dawkins, you haven't heard about him for a while. He wrote, he was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse of new atheism back in the um, early 2000s. After who is bad, now see how high the stakes are that we have to get rid of all religion. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking the gloves off. And Richard Dawkins wrote his famous book, The God Delusion, that was gonna make everyone uh, give up on Christianity. And then the whole thing kind of petered out to a certain extent and the, the movement kind of ended. He said something last week that caught a lot of people's attention. Um, he said in a viral video, he was arguing for Christianity, kind of. And this is Russell Moore describing it. <laughs> Dawkins notes the plummeting of church attendance and Christian identification in his country, the UK, and says that on one level, he's glad to see it. Yet on the other hand, Dawkins continues, he's, quote, slightly horrified to see the promotion of Ramadan in the UK, the holy month for Muslims. Uh, after all... Dawkins said, he's a Christian in a Christian country. And that is very confusing so that he clarified. He made it clear that he's a cultural Christian, not a believer. He loves the hymns and the Christmas carols and the cathedrals, everything about Christianity except, well, the Christ. He says, I like to live in a culturally Christian country, although I do not believe a single word of the Christian faith. So uh, Christians have been trying to figure out how to react to this. Um, our buddy Mike. So. So of course this is thing, and and I actually think Sky with his Santa Claus thing has a good point, and then um, what's her name, Caitlin, I think makes an excellent point. So I want to I want to cover those. Um, you know they're not yeah. they're not on a on a dimmer. That's right. all. Okay. <laughs> okay. Pregnancy is not on a dimmer. I get it. Correct. For, first Sky makes a rather pedantic point, but his next point I think is a good one. It's a good analogy. Horrified uh, is not on a dimmer. Yes. All right, so now to the substance of what he's saying here. Um, <laughs> okay. Obviously, concur entirely with both with what Russell Moore has said and what Caitlin is saying, that you, you can't cut the branch you're sitting on and all, all these virtues that we see in a society that's been deeply embedded through Christian faith comes from a belief in a real story. I don't want to necessarily defend Dawkins. I just want to understand him a little bit. And I think the best I've been able to come up with 
is that he's viewing the benefits of Christianity a little bit like the way you might argue, I, I like a society in which children believe in Santa Claus. And obviously, as a grown adult, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but it's charming to me that there are mm -hmm. children who believe in songs. Santa Claus. I love the songs. I love the tradition. Right, I love the song. I love... I love the fact that they wait in line to sit on his lap at the department mm -hmm. store. I love the TV shows, all that. But when they grow out of it, as they will with time and intelligence, it's better for them to grow out of it, but then they can have their own children that they enculturate into that stuff as yeah. well. I and, think that's kind of we how hope... he views the gospel. We hope we don't stop giving presents on that event. Right. So cuz I don't <laughs> right. want to lose I don't want right. to lose the feel even though I don't believe it. Yes. Any of it's true. Right. Yeah. So I, and I think that's a good analogy. Now I also want to make a point that of course Chad is going out looking for alt, other alt, other flotillas and of course he found the Canadian welders. But I haven't really done a video on the Canadian welders, but if, if you want to see what's going on, go down to Friday Morning Nameless and you can see what Chad's doing there because Chad's always doing great work. If you're not, if you're not, if you're not at least keeping an eye on what Chad is doing, you're, you're probably not really following, you're sort of at the heart of the channel. But, you know, I was watching sort of these three, I was thinking, okay, how is, how is their little thing different from our little thing? And one of the things are, is they don't bring randos on. And that's, that's what I challenged Elizabeth Oldfield with. I said, Elizabeth, you know, what if you brought randos in? And of course, they're you know they're going to bring highfalutin people who've written for Christianity Today and have written evangelical books uh, produced by Zundervan, and they're going to bring all those all those kind of people on. Um, but they're not going to bring randos on because randos randos take time, and if you're actually going to deal with randos, you're actually going to need to have sort of a a a nested a nested a nested community in which to 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 have new little estuary spaces and new little um and new little tidal pool things for the new randos to come in and continue to build out more it's sort of like a in some ways sort of like a, a um um a coral reef grows i'll say it that way um, we can add that to the the ever expanding flotilla of um ever expanding um, use of metaphors here. So, so I liked Sky's thing, but this isn't exactly TLC, is it? It's, it's very interesting. And so I've, you know, Chad, um, Chad and his other flotillas, you know, really has me thinking about, okay, what exactly are we doing? How's this go? And I'm going to include some of today's live stream at the end of this, because they gets into some of this. And I think the way that we're handling uh, what's at the heart of this is sort of the vitally important question at the moment here, which I really don't find these guys really grappling with. I think the Catholics, Tim Keller, I think was grappling it with with it a little bit better with that clip that I often show, and um, and I think the Catholics are sort of coming to grip with it, and the Orthodox sort of are too, because remember the Orthodox and the Catholics, they had their civilizational religion contained within an institution right next to the institution, often monarchies, of their thing. And what happened in America was a very different thing that arose where you had a an institution-less Christianity, really a cultural Christianity that was that was Protestantism that came over from the you know the puritans and the pilgrims and all of the other protestants that came over from england and of course the catholics came in and sort of became protestant in the but but the american thing has always been different and and part of what has held the american cultural christianity together was we were sort of a majority and whether and even though there wasn't sort of one hierarchical institution that either had a pope or a metropolitan on top of it that sort of the the body itself and the beliefs of the body itself sort of held the thing together. Maybe I'll just drop the Tim Keller clip in there. Um, I don't know if I, I'd have to find that clip um, as a clip. So, and so what's happening in America, of course, is very different. And hence all of the, well, what are we and how pluralistic are we? And ostensibly the American experiment held that well, there's a separation of church and state. Now, of course, the states could have state churches, but that went away. And so America's experiment in all of this is right next to the Protestant experiment in this. And as sort of the, 
the, the Protestant experiment continues to, in some ways, it's not really withering. What is it doing? It's not really, it's, is it receding with modernity? What is the Protestant experiment doing now that it's so hitched with sort of the American experiment? And of course, the, the, the old world, the old world monarchies with state churches just basically gave up. I mean, and what, I mean, when you look at what's happened in the UK, they have a state church. The Netherlands has a state church. All of these Western European countries have state churches and, you know, they're in worse shape than America. So all of this stuff is, you know, the major stuff that we're sort of wrestling with. Now, I really liked what, what Caitlin had to say. Let's see if it's right on the heels of it here. I think what Dawkins is saying is in a very kind of patronizing way is he's saying, I hope there's enough ignorant people in society that still believe in Jesus, that we get the benefits of Christianity. Mm -hmm. But for the rest of us who are really intelligent. And I think Sky is right here. And of course, if Dawkins would think this through as an evolutionary biologist, he would have to ask, to, to borrow some of Glenn Scrivener's language. Now, Glenn Scrivener has covered this quite well, but he's covered it really from a UK perspective. You'd have to ask, well, if I like the fruits, but the roots are based on lies and deception and ignorance and stupidity, in terms of evolutionary psychology, that doesn't really work unless you really sort of give yourself over to a certain, a certain, a certain nihilism. Who've moved beyond such superstition and myth. We don't need that. But there's mm -hmm. a segment that keeps it going, and we're grateful for the byproducts of that. But we... we... And of course, what, what Peterson has done in there is basically look at Dawkins and say, and, and, and in some ways, um, Brett Weinstein, too, have looked at Dawkins and say, bad fruit doesn't come from bad genetics. Something has to work functionally. And so, therefore, if you... If you cherish the fruit you have to at least acknowledge truth in the roots i think that's really key intelligent scientifically minded enlightened people we don't need the myths anymore thank you very much mm -hmm. and and that gets to the idea of well how do you affirm the effects of christianity and yet deny all of its truth claims like he does and i think it's a little bit like the santa claus stuff well even even more so how you know, if if what's annoying him this week is that the UK is officially recognizing Ramadan. Mm -hmm. How, on what basis do you say that doesn't belong here if you're not saying, well, see, we have a state church and a state religion. And so, well, and again, we're still really trying to deal with pluralism. And in some ways, the pluralism of Protestantism in America both afforded a degree of comfort with pluralism, limited pluralism, but also sort of pushed back the question that, let's say, that they're really wrestling with in, in, in Europe, partly just because of the immigration patterns that many, many of our immigrants are coming up are Roman Catholic from Latin America. You know, we're a Christian nation. If you, if you don't if you yourself don't ascribe to any of the tenets of the faith and don't feel logically that anyone else should, how do you reject the tenets of someone else's faith? On what basis? Other than that we should all be faithless, except I want the trappings of the one that we used to have because I well, like the Christmas cookies. But his base, exactly, he likes the Christmas cookies. His basis is he thinks the, the fruit of Christianity is better than the fruit of Islam. Yeah. And he's unapologetic about that. I, we talked about this actually on last week's uh, Skypod with, with Drew Dick, the same story. And, and I, I'm not a Brit, so I'm not going to sit here and criticize the UK. But I do find Please it ironic don't. that... They're, a, they're, a, a, they're an underprivileged minority. We, we can right. not say I do find it ironic that Dawkins is sitting here, you know, at the pinnacle of British society as, as, a, as a professor and world-famous writer and scientist 
He's been part of an empire that colonized the quarter of the world, and now he's upset that some of those colonized peoples are coming back to Great Britain and bringing their culture yeah. with them. Now, of course, Sky has um, ethnic roots in India, but the point here isn't colonialism. The point here is pluralism and the patterns of migration in the world today aren't simply oh we laid the pipes with with colonialism and people are just walking up the pipes that we laid no 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 people are migrating to the wealthier places of the world and the freer places of the world and so that particular bit of analysis that sky always goes to sort of the economic you know what's at the bottom economics it's like sky you should you should ask yourself you should ask yourself about that um about sort of that that default move that you keep oh everything's explained by economics carl carl do i hear do i hear carl in the background and, and it's like yeah. well this is the effect of being a colon a colonizer and yeah. now you're complaining about it caitlin is rich. having a hard time not interrupting you <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. Um, I think the other part of this that's important is... There are a lot of feminists who would really have had a hard time with that moment. I'm just saying. I think having read this article and read a few other takes on what Dawkins said, I do think part of what's challenging about trying to live in a pluralistic society and claiming that you come from nowhere, which is what you kind of have to do if you're going to say, I'm not coming from any tradition. I don't belong to any faith. I'm not. I'm just a person who rationally discerns all of the things I believe. It is so hard to exist in a pluralistic world if you come from nowhere and no one. And it's just you out there in the world. Mm. And I do think this is... If you think you come, or if you state you come from nowhere and no one, and that's exactly, this is a great point that she makes. It's a great point. And it's it's in many ways similar to the point that Peugeot likes to make about, depends on where you're standing. Because you don't come from nowhere. And in fact, all of this fruit doesn't come from nowhere. It in fact does come from somewhere. And this is the point she leans into. Another, again, I'm just going to say this about multiple things he said, that this is an opportunity for us to to freshly articulate one of the gifts of Christianity that we have forgotten or haven't practiced well, one of them being mm -hmm. that we actually can have better resources for engaging a pluralistic world. We haven't always done this, absolutely, but we could because we can say really strongly, I do come from a certain place. I come out of this tradition. I was taught these things in my church as a child or as an adult. This is where I'm coming from. And there's almost a greater security there because I'm coming from a stable community that isn't threatened by other communities. Mm -hmm. I then, because I can say I come from there, can interact with someone like Dawkins is, is doing, interacting with people from other parts of the world, other religious traditions. And it's not like our conversation threatens my identity because I know where I come from. I come from these people and we believe these things. And I can learn from you and I can ask questions from you and I can bring the gifts of my tradition. You can bring the gifts of yours. But if we just exist as isolated individuals, like with our own made up ideas about the world, then every conversation I have with someone threatens my identity because we're always figuring out do, how much do I agree with you and how much instead of the, uh, the relative safety of actually I've, I've seen this in my own city in some interfaith conversations and some community organizing conversations where because we all come as churches, this community organizing group requires you come through a church or another community organization, there's a little bit more freedom to disagree and talk through why we disagree because everyone knows where they come from. Like you're coming mm -hmm, from this conservative mm -hmm. church. I, I can kind of know why you believe the things you believe and what you believe. You're coming from this synagogue or this mosque or this um, secular community organization. I have some sense of where you're coming from and what commitments you bring with you. And I think too often a Dawkins-esque way of engaging with the world that many Americans believe as well, and many Christian Americans believe as well, is I leave my commitments at the door, I enter into the public square as an individual with my own individual beliefs, and that makes it really scary to encounter difference. It's a little easier to encounter difference if you know where you come from and you right. know where other people come from. Mm. And, I, and I think a lot of the criticism that these guys get is, I think, from people who are let's say not living in Carroll Stream, Illinois, and not basically running the American evangelical circuit, sort of cringing at the elephants and the tanks with Chuck Norris in, uh, wanting to really much more be heirs of the um, mid-20th century mainline um, 
cultural leaders, let's say, they're, they're all aspiring to be Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1940s. Um, and Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1940s, wonderful person, you know, impacted the world, United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, I mean in some ways that was sort of peak American uh, Protestant, self-conscious, self-confident civilization. But of course, I've talked about this before, the, the civil rights movement and American Protestants having to face generations of racial, the racial discrimination that they had done at their hands caused a crisis of confidence that in many ways the civilization has never recovered from. And so, hence, we're at the moment that we're at. But where this then connected to the TLC was in this morning's live stream that Luke led, where they were having a really good sort of comparing notes with Judaism and Christianity, with Hezi in there, and and uh, Jonathan, who's, is it Jonathan? Um, he's been on... He he does a he does a Bible study on Jacob Federici's channel. I think they're in Joshua right now, and he he really is doing some really good work. He sort of hushes the group by by bringing in some really good, very some from really good biblical stuff that gets traction, which then begins to then then suddenly the conversation becomes self aware that well we're sort of dealing with this Jewish Christian dynamic here, and of course Hezi and Israeli whose parents moved from the United States back to Israel. And again, I think part of what we're seeing, how this little corner is much more of the internet age. People like Phil. Phil comes from making videos. Sky. Sky is uh, basically comes from doing a podcast. They're using the internet for dissemination. And in that way, people are using the internet in a way that the printing press was used. And I think in this little corner, we are now using the internet in the next stage of evolution, let's say Web 2.0, edging into, I don't know, Web 3.0 is gonna be AI, we'll have to see about that. But what you can see happening in this little corner is that it isn't a screen full of experts, it is YouTube. And it is people coming out from out of lurkerdom. And it is the pluralism that is out there in the world coming onto the screen. And we're actually practicing it in real time together, figuring this out, doing this work together. And in that way, I think what we are doing here in the corner is, is beyond what, let's say, the Holy Post is doing. And I think the Holy Post is... You know, there are things I critique and things I appreciate about it, but I think it's limited, and it's limited by the fact that they, like most Christians on YouTube, are looking, are using the internet as a way of disseminating information, whereas I think in the little corner, we are using the internet as a way of being virtually not alone, breaking the fourth wall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to include that segment from today's live stream and then a little bit of branding and that'll be the end of this video so uh let me know what you think kezi do you yeah do you think from your experience in judaism and i mean this is a crappy question so i apologize in advance but i'm curious and i think this is a brave space do you think jewish people are uh in an in a potentially unhealthy way indoctrinated against being open to perspectives on Jesus? It, it, well, but let's put aside that, that he's God, right? Everything else in that 1,000%. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's built on 2,000 years. Of, there's so much trauma, right? Of, yeah. I mean, crusades, death, persecution. So there's all that built in. Right. There's, there's clearly the tension in second, in second uh, temple period where, where, <laughs> I only think now people are starting to realize that um, it, it is a ongoing, or at least at the time, it was an ongoing live conversation responding to each other, Christianity and Judaism at those earlier stages. Um, and, and you know, dealing with ideas of two powers in heaven, dealing with ideas of that Rabbi Akiva himself were, play, were potentially yeah. playing around with these ideas. So uh, at some point, once we picked a lane, 
it's very important then, or historically, to sort of maintain the community. Um, so for you know many, many years, while, while I talk about a theological and a, and a, a legalistic, a halachic uh, um, uh, exoskeleton we built ourselves in, in exile, some of that also includes our aversion towards Muslims and Christians, and it's very, very difficult to take off that exoskeleton that, exoskeleton that already defined you. Uh, there are, of course, rabbis uh, that uh, were engaging, and uh, and and like you were roughly a thousand years ago, but that th the reality was that wasn't something that could actually be um, promulgated at the time for mainly for political reasons and also due to the the fear of intermarriage, etc., uh, etc. Et we are in a magical time today. So I yeah. you know I, I say this ad nauseum that like uh, this conversation would have been crazy to have had uh, like this forever ago. It was happening. I think the church fathers and the rabbis in their teachings were sort of responding to each other in a certain way when they were writing these things. But uh, yes, there. If this conversation would make many, many people feel uncomfortable in my community. And one-on-one, -on -one I could tease it out as, as like a community that would be, a, it would be, a, it would be a mistake fourth for me. Fourth century, to, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. It would be a mistake Jeremy, for me. Jeremy, fourth century. To uh, to like publicize this life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Judaism has been living. At least European Judaism has been living in a Christian world for fifteen hundred years. Right, and it's been experiencing conversion loss to Christianity that whole time. Some amount of conversion yeah. gain, but probably more loss than gain over the long haul. And so the the versions of Judaism that still exist have extremely strong antibodies against yeah. uh conversion loss to christianity and like i it's also true that like protestants have like these little sayings that oftentimes religious communities that live next to other religious communities that they're scared of losing their people to mm -hmm. have these various sayings short little things that get caught in people's heads that help prevent uh, conversion loss, like, oh, those Catholics, they worship Mary, and things like that, like shorthand yeah. things that probably have some amount of truth and some amount of lie in them, and Catholics have their own thing, like, if you ask people that have been super sheltered Catholics what they think of Protestantism, you know, you will get these shorthand little quips, right, that are meant to prevent a Catholic person from ever being curious about Protestantism, and yeah, Judaism and has, has, and Judaism has tons of those things, uh, that I've experienced in my relationship with Jewish people in terms of what they think and what they know and what they rumor whisper about Christianity when, you know, the Christians aren't listening and stuff. Well, like I'm going to double click on this point, Sam, because what both of you said is fantastic. But then, so in PVK's treatment of the live stream yesterday or whatever, NJ and Anselman kept going back and forth they couldn't understand why I want Sam to talk to Gavin so much and, and why I'm such a fan of that and why I think it's such a good thing. Cause there's like, Luke, you're a Trinitarian. Why do you want this Unitarian to be talking to Gavin? Shouldn't you be on team Gavin? And I'm just like, you guys still don't understand what I'm doing. You guys don't understand what this is. I don't think I'm not for ideological tribalism. I'm for personalist knowing and I love Sam. Well, you think that I'm like a Satan figure who can help torture some of these overly propositional Protestants. There is that. I don't, there is that, is that you're a foil, I think, to point out the inconsistencies in aspects of Protestantism. You dang right. Um, there is that aspect of it. But it's also that I truly believe, too, that what this community is, is a relational space and that is based in the person and we talk about ideas and we do it in such a way that is open that allows us to really think together out loud and let the cards fall where they may instead of a zero-sum ideological game that's not a community then i mean what you're describing then is, and i was just recently talking about this with yosef which is and and i, I this came up from your stream when i heard lance talking to you guys and then he mentioned Lance was talking to some other group and he said, I'm being TLC wherever I go. Mm. And I was wondering if that's a, a more proper way of looking at it is TLC is more of a mindset, a posture 
a way of thinking less of like a community that they, they they're not mutually exclusive but i think like what's happening in the space and and it's apropos our conversation right now which is can all these tensions be held and can love still be shared and the space still be shared right so sam and 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 a Jew and a Trinitarian and an Orthodox. And so you, you have all that conversation. And like you said, but I still love Sam. And well, an Orthodox, is, a Jew oh, sorry, and a Unitarian walk into a bar. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But, but, but it's funny that you're saying, but that's used as a joke because, I mean, we have a comedian over here. He'll let us know. But because um, it's, it's almost comical to think of that being our actual reality. When, when it, what, what we're doing right now is actually turning that into a, 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 a reality which is not one that's humorous. It's not, of course, it's, joy, it's joyful, but it's not, necessarily, uh, it's not necessarily a punchline or a joke. It's more about a manifesting reality, and I think it's two-tiered. Because in a, cert, in a certain way, I get a lot of love in this corner, yet you would think that between the Christians, there would be even a tighter grouping. Yet sometimes I feel that like there's more tension between like Sam and a Calvinist than there is between me and Sam. So like, which is very interesting to me. And I think that this is not true about Christianity in large, but definitely in the TLC where people are playing with removing those veils and still managing to, to see each other as truly Christian. It's Which interesting, though, too, amazing. though, because, Hezzy, I think that your difference makes it so that people don't take your disagreement personally, right? I remember my sister saying that she was really looking forward to when she moved out of my parents' house so that she could get along with them. Is that there's a certain amount of closeness that relates to a grinding that um, there, there's a difficulty in this of, like, if, if I see your perspective is so different from me, it's not a threat, then it's just interesting or entertaining or whatever, right? And so there's this back and forth of how close to create a grinding. I mean, even in the language that I was using, I didn't want to use too explicit language that the Zohar uses because that's sometimes considered pornographic, uh, for lack of a better term, where it's like how much intimacy, how close before that closeness is, is a friction where it's like, I find, Sam, we've never talked before, but I find a lot of the material of people who are um, who are really poking and prodding my own tradition so important. Um, and it's this like, how close do you allow and how much grinding? Because there's no, like I've experienced no grinding from Hindus, none whatsoever because it's, it, I find it so different from my own tradition, if that makes sense. Like the, mm -hmm. the family conflict is, is much more intense than, than the conflict I have with a stranger. I, I find the space so weird <laughs> that I, I keep asking myself, what is it that we owe each other in what we're doing here? And I don't have a good answer. Um, but that's just the question that keeps plaguing my mind. What do we owe each other? Cause I, and I, even thinking of like the, the sort of interaction that happened between Luke and Sam on the, the orthodoxy live stream. It's there was not, some grinding in that one. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we owe each other politeness. I don't think we necessarily owe each other, um, you know, like pl placating, where we think yeah. somebody else is wrong. But there is something about owing each other at least some relational aspect to make this sort of play that we're doing um, safe in the chaos that is YouTube and the internet um, out, <laughs> in the outside and sometimes even inside this corner. So it's like, what, what do we owe each other and, and how do we manifest that in the way we create, the way we consume, and then the way we commune about those things. Yeah, maybe disagreeing well, because that's the thing. I've had lots of very impassioned disagreements with people over the years in TLC. And I can think of some, and some of them felt completely fine. Like I didn't, I at the end of the day, I didn't just constantly think about it and uh, 
feel horrible about the interaction. Like that one with Sam, I didn't think anything about it. It was great. I know Sam is for me. But then there are people who I who disagree with me, for example, it doesn't feel great. It doesn't feel like they really love me. It doesn't feel like they're for me. It feels like they're angry at me. Does Anselman love you, Luke? I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for <laughs> it. It doesn't feel like he likes me very much. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> <clears throat> The connection I've been making is to like Mr. Rogers. That's that's kind of where my mind has gone like recently is um, seeing the way that he was able to connect with people very different from him. Um, and also people who are, you know, incredibly intelligent, but then also children and somehow being able to speak in a way simply to everyone in a respectful way and really listened like looked at people in the eye and really paid attention and made sure that the person he was talking to is like being paid attention to. Yeah. And that was the way he expressed love. And I think that that kind of comes back. Like it, it's not even about the way you argue, argue or anything. It's like just the, the treatment of, of people. And there's not like a good guidebook to it, but it is something that I, I want to at least try to, to emulate in whatever way I can. He's a good model. It's a great, I cry to that movie. It's fantastic. Yeah. Do not have any depth with uh, each other except uh, but love. That's, uh, well said. So I um, own you love. I, uh, not uh, much less, not much more. I, uh, I wonder what that love looks like though. Because again, yeah. like uh, maybe this is just me, but in a relationship, I see it again like the atonement is that even just being in this world, things become filthy, things break down. And so this idea that in order even for a friendship to be maintained <clears throat> requires um, requires a forgiveness, requires a rejuvenating aspect of it. Um, and that that is in and of itself a kind of a kind of difficulty. Like you 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 celebrate um, celebrate you fulfill Yom Kippur by by strickening your soul for a day, right? Um, and so, to what extent that is that is also what's required between different groups of people, like a, an extension of forgiveness or even an extension of. Um, uh, assuming good faith, I think is, is also that it's like, I am going to let myself be played by you is an extension of good faith. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I'm going to operate as though you're not lying. Okay. You want to trick me now? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Being willing to lose and die in every regard. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think, the question you asked, David, is the question that I ask, because love's the easy answer. It's like, oh, yeah, love. But what does that mean? What does that look like? It's going to be different in each situation, which with each pair of people, which with each, you know, set of people sit in a room like. Love is the easy answer, but it's not. Well, and, and not for the me, solution in, in, in some senses has a universal that. application. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think once you get past atonement, though, one of the things that's important to know is that after the Day of Atonement, which is, you know, the most mournful, the most like literally you're supposed to beat your chest as you confess your sins. Um, after that is a time of so much celebration that if you are in the middle of mourning a loved one, you're supposed to stop to celebrate tabernacles. Now, again, tabernacles is this feast that has eight days. So it's related to resurrection. And I think so many people and so much church is obsessed with uh, atonement, just like th the beauty of my relationship with my wife is not just the, the two of us going, sorry, 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 right? Is that at some point we actually get past that forgiveness. And once we're past the forgiveness, then we get this time where um, we can't help but be joyful, where we're like almost commanded to be joyful and and are no, like yeah can fully be in each other's presence alan has just outed himself as our judas 
<laughs> hey, 30 pieces is 30 pieces, you know? <laughs> Looks, like, we need one. We need one. You know? I mean, it's like, I yes, I need the love of God now, but I'm also not rich. So when I'm rich, I might not need that anymore. So it's just one of those things where it's like, yeah, for now, for here. Lord, save me from lust, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that the augustine quote that's something like that yeah yeah uh with this um i guess i just want to be careful because we talk about like there's like this sort of like spirit that's behind the proposition or that's like more fundamental than the propositions uh and is that i guess like i mean maybe we've clarified it it's like the spirit of love but I just want to be careful that that doesn't become like that's the real like the thing you believe in or the thing you have faith in. And then all this other stuff is sort of like not important or maybe that is what we're saying. Uh, but just saying like, oh, well, if you're nice and you're what we describe as loving in this space, then you're all part of our secret religion. And then you can go off into your corridor of your like whatever other religion, you know, we can call yourself this, that, and the third, but that's less important than the this fundamental baseline of how you, of getting into the space. So it's like the real important thing is getting into the room, is having this love that we're talking about or this belief that we're talking about. And then when you, where you go from there, it doesn't really matter. Uh, are the secret society where the Masonic handshake is being able to use Verveke's words? That's mm. basically it. Well, yeah. yeah. I, it's a well so i don't know we're, we're figuring out i think how to maintain distinction identitarian distinction around propositions and self-identity while maintaining some kind of tacit implicit unity underneath that which is the love like i don't think we need to deny what we think and what we believe about things and that's where we can have really serious strong worded earnest disagreements mm -hmm. but it's like i often think of it in terms of when jordan peterson was talking about psychopathy with uh destiny and he was saying that's the technical definition of a psychopath is you forefront short-term gain at the expense of the relationship mm -hmm. we should do the opposite of that we don't we do, we are willing to lose the ideological idea battle the propositional battle for the sake of the long-term relationship yeah yeah. And are we saying then that 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 spirit that allows you to orient towards the long term relationship is the spirit of love, which despite any religion or lack of religion, anyone can have? Um, I mean, that's Christ consciousness is what I would call it. And I realize that's kind of a absolutizing thing. But that's but that's also I mean, to quote that great McLuhan quote where Christ is the one place where the medium and the message is the same thing. That's what makes it the universal particular. And that's the whole mystery of Christ, which is Christ in me, which allows it to be universal, but also particular in every iteration. Mm -hmm. I think the way I would frame it would be that the propositions lead me to practically desire and pursue loving others well. And I'm, I'm not worried about what other people are doing. Like, that's just the way it's it's going for me. And so I'm going to I'm going to do that. And if people want to also do that, like, sure. But these are the propositions that that cause me to go this way. And I can have that conversation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I guess it's just I mean, I'm not like this, does, you know, it, but then it's like, are you closer with this group of people in the TLC who like, as, let's say if, let's say we all agreed like that, that love, whatever Christ consciousness, like that's what we want. And then we, we go to our churches or our synagogue or, you know, a mosque. And then we're like, these guys don't have that Christ consciousness or the, they don't have this instantiation of love. So I actually think of myself as more of a TLC person than a, um, you know, uh, associated with my church or mosque or temple. Um, because at TLC, they prioritize the love and here they, I see all these people who are nasty sinners or like nasty, mean poopy heads and, uh, and just being careful not to be like, oh, well the, the real, the people who really understand love are on the internet, but the people who don't are at my, ch at my local church. But, but I think, uh, part of it is, is where the rubber meets the road, the idea of it's it, like long-term, short-term love 
I only have to love you guys for like, yeah, for, for how long, mm. right? Before I can turn you off, I can move away and everything else. Um, as soon as I stop these streams, I just go around screaming at every member of my family, <laughs> like pushing them down because I've expended so much <laughs> love here. All that's left is hate. <laughs> right, right. Wow. No, but but that is like that you can understand that as something that like I have a friend and she shares with me the Jordan Peterson quotes she gets from men trying to pick her up on dating apps. Oh man, can you share those with me? Okay. Yeah. Like, wait, wait, are those working? Because I've been sending out a lot. <laughs> Could you let me know? Because I'm getting blocked like, a lot on post, every app. And she uh, posted this. Some... Miss Jordan Peterson said that. You know, <laughs> well, it's the, well where it first came up, up is she's talking with some guy, and he starts talking about the Pareto distribution. Hero. And Hero, man. Yeah, and and. She's posting about this on Facebook and this is a close friend of mine. And I send, I send her a message and just say, I know this is tough and I know this is horrible, but please don't give up on understanding that theorem. It's very important. <laughs> oh. But like, I mean, even, <laughs> even that this becomes an idea that people think of that, you know, were there no Peterson people that were just terrible men? Right. Like is I, I know that there was a lot of uh, misrepresentation, but there was also some representation. Right. Where um, how much of the of the love of the full integration of these things are actually applied by people in their daily lives versus things they find interesting on the Internet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, well, even well, that is a good illustration of why we need we need instantiated real life practice. Where like you can find BTLC, but then that's why Peugeot, PVK, everybody says go to church, or you know, or go to mosque, or go to temple. Do whatever you need to do. I mean, you need to be around fully embodied people at some point. Like this is fine as an addition, or as a supplement, or as a training ground, or as a dojo. But like, I'm not of the mind that you can live in the metaverse. Right. Uh, yeah, I would. I mean, that's like hilarious and hilariously sad. But it also shows that like, uh, I mean, apps are just as much the internet as anything else. Like, <laughs> and it, it just makes me sad that uh, people don't, you know, don't go to church because, yeah, that guy who's quoting Peterson to you, maybe there's a 50 percent chance. I don't know what the numbers are. 50 percent. He's a psycho, but 50 percent chance. He's just an awkward guy. And I think that's also like a prejudice we have of like <laughs> people just suck at online interaction. They don't have that smoothness that H math talks about. Like you're just annihilated. Like, yeah, being <laughs> talking to people means making awkward comments <laughs> and being weird. Like that's also part of it. And uh, yeah. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people have been gifted with just, just, uh, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. And a lot of young men have a little bit of knowledge. Uh, and, you know, and honestly, some of those girls should text me back because <laughs> I know I let off with talking about, <laughs> you know, saving your father from the belly of the beast. But really, I just wanted to be your beast in Beauty and the Beast with me and you. Um, it's probably part of the riz, isn't it? Just like rolling good. with the awkward because you're going to be awkward at some points. But then if you can absorb that and roll with it, you're showing robustness, you know. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and I, like I, I've had conversations with people about the notion of the of the village because I actually have a neighbor who's right next to me who's a rather disagreeable guy. But you have to figure out a piece with your actual neighbor <laughs> um, where you don't have to with uh, with randos on the internet. Um, where like there there has to be a a burying or going past. Like one of the ways I think about it is. If you were in a town and there's only one guy who makes cheese and he's racist, um, you got to deal with the, you have to make peace with this racist dude. You can't cancel him because otherwise you don't get any ricotta. That's, that's the way that works, right? You want cheddar? Well, then get past the fact that this guy is a little bit of a douche. All right. You just got to get it right. Like, and, but what that is so interesting to me, though, is because then you find out that the guy who's racist 
has actually had more relationships with people of color than your friends who are non-racist. And you only understand that through contact, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I grew up across from Detroit and a lot of people who had more interaction with people of color were sometimes the people that used the, the biggest stereotypes. It, mm. it was, yeah, it was, it was part of that grinding, if I might state, of, <laughs> of being in direct contact with people. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I'm a huge proponent of, uh, I mean, yeah, of that actually meeting and interacting with people. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it just, I don't know, whatever. It's so, it's, to me, it's so obvious that it's just go to church, go, go interact with real human beings, go actually have real relationships and, you know, turn off. I mean, it's funny because I, I don't use Instagram that much, but recently I redownloaded it. And within like, a minute they just have your blood up it's just everyone is against me except my allies who i must support like they're so good at just showing you exactly what what there there is to get your blood up or to be like oh the perfect the perfect you know <laughs> okay you know what tayo if i need if i if it if the lord calls upon me to embody a spirit of grinding i'm not gonna hesitate to grind okay yeah that's that's why uh, two brothers together, like ironing, sharpening iron, right? Mm -hmm. It's a grinding. Two brothers grinding. Two, yeah, brothers two, grinding. two brothers grinding. David's a fan of two brothers grinding. Yeah. Now we know he's when one is alone, who does he have to grind against? That's so true. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like this is devolving into just Alan and McMoe's just nonstop, nonstop joke fest that they had yeah. on Friday Morning Nameless. Yeah, guys, and, we need to be serious. This is and like, I have to I know. It. Joking is fine, but I'm just saying I'm going to go soon because I have to save my voice for Pete. Wow. Yeah. But you guys can keep rolling without me if you want to. And then just everyone can leave when they want to. <laughs> and then it will just stop. <laughs> it's just like maybe, maybe a live stream is like the universe. If like human consciousness, like if there was nobody there to observe it, would it, would it just stop being? Like if human beings didn't exist, would the world exist? Maybe it's like a live stream and all the people leave and it just goes. Mm. Yeah. That's why I, that's what I believe about the world. When I like, you know, turn around, it stops existing. So that's why I can mistreat everyone in my life, you know, is because, you know, yeah, when I stop looking at you, you won't exist, idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Dummy. Mm. All right. Pete just said I should check my email. Does this mean we're not even doing it anymore? Pete's bailed on me. Well, if, if this is a good place to end. All right. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing it. <laughs> okay, bye. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. All right. Well, anyhow, on that note, thanks everyone for coming. Good to see you all. Thanks, Hopefully guys. we solved some things or didn't or we're in the yeah. process of it. Don't be afraid to grind. <laughs> Let's grind it out. This one's come to a grinding halt. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Approaches are that's where that's where the alignment is between Grim and I. Okay. So what is bringing down the fourth wall project? Grim? A terrible spell. And part of that spell, the, the humans have a campfire circuitry. Um, for whatever reason, probably because it. So like. The television engages that. And like, that's when your tribal elders are passing on information and stuff. So like those things are hijacked and make you, everybody feel like they're audience. And like, you'll, like if you watch characters and series that do break the fourth wall, and that's, that's what the fourth wall I'm referencing when I do it. It's the, the wall that behind which you are audience and not a human. So. Okay. Hashtag paintball for Jesus at Grim Grizz. Hashtag break the fourth wall. Like you, you do like break the fourth wall that doesn't exist and be like. Break the fourth wall a little bit. You, you, you really helped me break the fourth wall. It's like, you know, it's just people. Good poetry is definitely, it's ask, it's definitely always trying to break the fourth wall. Always tried, as Grim Gris says, to break the fourth wall to the degree that I can. <laughs>